If I'm being honest, I often forget that this Pokemon, Crawdont, is from Generation 3. Growing up, I don't think I saw it once in the game, and then later in like 2015, I finally realized that it was actually introduced in Generation 3, and I was stunned. So today, I'm going to do a solo playthrough with it in Pokemon Emerald. Now, I'm doing this because it is another fluctuating growth rate Pokemon like Breloom that I played yesterday. Today, I nicknamed mine Lobster. I think this thing is actually a crawfish, <laughs> which, uh, yeah, I find funny. So let's start talking about Crawdont and some of its statistics. For base stats, it has 63 HP, an incredible 120 attack, 85 defense, a decent 90 special attack, 55 special defense, and 55 speed. Now in Generation 3, the Water and the Dark type both deal special damage, which is pretty unfortunate since this thing is a physical attacker. However, because of this fact, I don't want to lower its special attack with my nature. So today I'm going to go with a naughty nature, which boosts its physical attack and lowers its special defense. Its special defense was already quite low, and I don't want to lower its physical defense just because I need to prepare for Steven. Okay, next let's talk about Crawdon's abilities, because it has access to two different ones, Shell Armor or Hyper Cutter. Shell Armor prevents the opponent from getting critical hits, but Hyper Cutter is much better because it prevents your attack from being lowered. This is going to counter so many Intimidate users throughout Pokemon Emerald, so I think it's a no-brainer. Alright, so now let's get into its move pool. It starts with Bubble, which is honestly not a very good water move. It gets Harden to boost its defense, Leer to lower the enemy's defense, and Vice Grip to utilize its incredible attack stat. Through level up, it gets access to Bubble Beam fairly early on, then Protect, Knock Off, Taunt, Crab Hammer, which is one of the coolest move names. And finally, the last useful move is going to be Swords Dance, which it gets at level 44. Now through TM and HM, it actually gets access to a wide diversity of moves. Water Pulse, Ice Beam, Blizzard, Rain Dance, Return, Dig, Brick Break, Sludge Bomb, Rock Tomb, Aerial Ace, Secret Power, and Surf. Honestly, this is quite a good move pool, but unfortunately for Crawdont, the physical moves it has access to are not that good. Like, for example, it would be great if this thing could learn Earthquake. Because Crawdont is weak to fighting, bug, grass, and electric types, it's actually going to have a pretty good time with Hoenn. There are no major trainers that have prominent bug types or grass types, and the fighting and electric gyms come early on in the playthrough. However, I do think that Watson could be very problematic. Luckily for me though, water type moves deal neutral damage to electric types, so I'm not anticipating too many problems there. Now just before I start narrating this playthrough, I want to give a spoiler warning. If you haven't seen yesterday's Breloom video, I really encourage you to check it out first because I'm going to compare results between Crawdont and Breloom throughout this run. Last time I did two videos in one weekend, I didn't give this spoiler warning and there were some people that were a little bit frustrated about that, so I'm really sorry. And now, with that out of the way, let's get into this playthrough. In the early game, I think it is a best practice to fight most of the trainers, just so you're getting a decent level by the time you reach, say, Brawly and then later Watson. He is one of the hardest gym leaders for most Pokemon. Also for Crawdont, this is fairly easy because Vice Grip is dealing a lot of damage with my base attack stat, and Bubble is able to quickly sweep through all of the Pokemon in Roxanne's gym. So now, let's take her on. Up first is Geodude, of course Bubble does 4 times damage, and it knocks it out. That means I'm going to one-hit KO her second one as well, and move on to her Ace Nose Pass. Now this thing has pretty good special defense, I do go for Bubble here because obviously Vice Grip isn't a good option. Unfortunately, I'm only doing about a quarter. It uses Rock Tomb, and it actually misses, not once, but twice. Also, I should mention here that Bubble has a 10% chance to lower the opponent's speed, which actually brings about an interesting AI interaction. The Nose Pass thinks that Rock Tomb is a speed control move, so it is going to continue to prioritize it until my speed drops below Nose Pass's speed, which normally is a bad thing because you want the Nose Pass to be using moves like Tackle and Block, maybe Harden as well. But in this case, uh, Rock Tomb isn't doing that much, so I easily am able to defeat Roxanne. 
With the first badge, my Crawdaunt is going to get a 10% boost to its attack stat, which is going to make Vice Grip just completely awesome now. I wanted to try this out against Brendan. There's an optional fight just south of Rustboro City. Here, I'm able to one-hit KO the Wingle, and I actually almost KO the Trico, but it just uses Pound. Could have used Absorb. Anyways, I knock it out, and now it's time to head to Duford Town. Here, my first errand is to pick up the Silk Scarf, which is actually immediately useful. I'm not used to that in a lot of my Emerald playthroughs, because some Pokemon just don't have access to a good Normal-type move by this point in the game. And there are no Normal TMs that you can use to teach your Pokemon moves. Like, I guess you could use Cut, but like, Cut is not good. Today, the Silk Scarf is going to be powering up Vice Grip, making it even more powerful. After that, I deliver the letter to Steven Stone, and now I have a tricky choice to make. Crawdont is pretty good, but most dark types really struggle against Brawly. The thing about him is that you can actually skip him until you defeat Flannery. After that, you need to defeat Brawly before you can face Norman. However, today I decided to go into his gym and fight some of the random gym trainers, because once I level up to level 20, Crawdont has access to Bubble Beam. And I think with this move on my side, I might just stand a chance against Brawly. So let's see if I can do this. His lead is Machop. First of all, I'm going to go for Harden, just to boost my defense a little bit for the rest of the fight. Machop also loves to go for Bulk Up, which is what it does on the first turn, so I was anticipating this. Because this move raised its defense, obviously Bubble Beam is the correct choice, but unfortunately it fails to get the damage range it needs. Low Kick does a third, Brawly uses a Super Potion, I reroll Bubble Beam, and this time it does enough damage. Okay, so it's time for the Metatite. This thing can only deal damage with Focus Punch, which is uh, really convenient for me because I can just keep attacking it and eventually knock it out for free. So this is all going to come down to if the Makuhita survives and hits me. I go for Bubble Beam, cross my fingers, and it gets the KO. All right, so a second easy victory over a gym leader for Crawdont. Now with Breloom, it could learn Bulk Up, but unfortunately today, Crawdont can't. So there isn't really a prize for defeating Brawly, other than the fact that I won't have to backtrack here later, which is going to save some time. Now, let's head to Slateport Beach. Here, I pick up the Soft Sand and do some training. This gives Crawdont the chance to learn Protect, I put it in the place of Leer, and then I learn Knock Off, and I teach it over Harden. By the way, I am anticipating that both of these moves could be useful at some point, but we'll have to wait and see. Next is Brendan. He leads with Slugma, which is absolutely terrible, so Bubble Beam one-shots it. After that, he sends in his ace, Grovile, and Vice Grip actually gets the one hit. All that's left is Wingle, so this fight is completely simple. Now, as I mentioned before, Water-type moves deal neutral damage to Electric-types and also to Steel-types, so luckily today, I don't think I'm going to need to teach Rock Smash to get through Watson's Magneton. I fight most of the trainers around Mauville City. This leads me to the Rust Turf Tunnel, where I can grab the Black Glasses. But honestly, Crawdont might be a Dark-type, but it does not get many good Dark-type moves. So I don't think these are actually going to end up being useful. I fight trainers in the gym, taking me up to level 33, and now I think I am ready for Watson. Bubble Beam has an advantage here because it means I don't make contact, and as a result I am not risking getting paralyzed by static. I'm able to one-hit the Voltorb and the following Electrike, and then Watson sends in his ace, Minectric, instead of Magneton. Alright, so that is a consistent opening to the fight. Unfortunately here, I am speed tied. The Minectric wins it, goes for Shockwave, and it does half. Alright, so that is my low special defense. Bubble Beam lowers its speed, which is perfect, but a Citrus Berry restores its health, and I'm gonna need more damage to knock it out. Maybe Vice Grip can do it? The answer is no, and a second Shockwave KOs. I think that there's actually a simple solution to this fight, because if I just train up one level to 34, then I'm going to outspeed the Manectric. This is going to dramatically change the math of the battle, and I think it'll give me a win. Also, this does give me the opportunity to learn Taunt. I had a suggestion on one of my previous videos that I should be using this move, especially against Watson's Magneton, to prevent Thunder Wave. However, today, Shockwave is just doing too much damage, so that's not going to be a viable play. This time, I wanted to start the fight off and use Vice Grip right away for more damage to ensure that I can get the 2-hit even when it heals with its Citrus Berry. Unfortunately, I realized here that this means it can paralyze me with Static. In this case, I used Thunder Wave, but that is an 
implication of using this move first. My Crawdont has the Silk Scarf, so it's not going to heal itself with a Cherry Berry. As a result, it fails to move, and Manectric gets the KO. Okay, so we can change up my move ordering, and that's going to fix this problem. If I use Bubble Beam on the first turn so that it can't static me... By the way, then Manectric just uses Howl, which is really lucky. After that, I can use Vice Grip on the second turn for more damage, and this takes it out. Alright, so I'm moving on to the Magneton for the first time. How much is Bubble Beam going to do to it? And the answer is so much, it actually takes it down to red health. It uses Thunder Wave to speed control my Crawdont. Watson heals with a Super Potion, which actually wastes his outspeed. Paralysis doesn't prevent my Bubble Beam. It does enough. And yeah, I beat Watson. This was not nearly as difficult as I thought it was going to be. With the Dynamo Badge, my Crawdont gets a 10% boost to its speed stat, which is quite needed. After all, this thing's pretty slow. So on the beach previously, I got the move Knock Off and Protect, which have both proved to be completely useless, but now it is time for some useful moveset upgrades. I can get Secret Power to upgrade Vice Grip, and I can get Dig and teach this in the place of Taunt. Honestly, I think I maybe taught this a little bit too soon, because Taunt could have been useful against Maxi's Mighty Yenna to prevent Sand Attack. Maybe I should have put Dig in the place of Knock Off. I really think I was trying to hold on to a damage dealing dark move just for the sake of it. Anyways, it turns out that after some annoying confusion stuff, Maxi doesn't end up being a problem because I have four times damage with Bubble Beam against his ace. So it was a sloppy fight, but an easy victory. And I expect that easy victories are going to continue because up next is Flannery. This fight should be completely trivial. I'm gonna one-hit the Nummel, of course, and the Slugma, and the Camerupt, because they all take so much damage from water moves. Like, I know the Slugma only takes two times damage, it is in fact not a rock type yet, but it's just trash anyways. After finishing off her second to last Pokemon, my Crawdont levels up, and here it can learn Crab Hammer. I really wanted to use this move just for style points. In retrospect though, I should have put it in the place of knockoff. Like, what am I doing keeping this thing on my set? Either way, Crab Hammer's a cool move, and it's still super effective against the Torkoal. Plus, here, its high critical hit ratio comes through, and I knock her ace out in one turn. So let's backtrack now to Fall Arbor Town. I'm going to pick up the Nugget along the way, and then I pick up the TM for Return, which is a fantastic upgrade for Secret Power. Now here I'll just mention, uh, it always feels weird when I'm doing these narrations, because the pacing is so strange between Flannery and Norman, there's like nothing to talk about. So here I'll just mention the fact that we have continued to foster cats. We have actually received our sixth foster cat at this point. Of course we adopted Churro, so he's our cat. He's like the welcoming wagon for all of the other cats. And right now we have a female torty cat, and she is so playful, and recording this voiceover is incredibly hard, because she just constantly plays with stuff and is making noise and running around. Anyways, she's really cute. She's only six months old. Absolutely adorable. Now that we've made it back to Petalburg City, let's prepare for Norman. To do this, I'm going to give Crawdon to Chestoberry, because Norman is known for using Yawn. Now that I'm prepared, let's take him on. Spinda is first, and I have learned not to underestimate this thing just because of Teeter Dance. I go for Crab Hammer, I get a crit, and knock it out in one turn. Next, Norman sends in Slacking. Here, I go for Crab Hammer because it's special and I can't be hit by counter. The Slacking goes for Yawn, then Crab Hammer KOs, and now I have the Berry to prevent myself from falling asleep. Next is Vigoroth. Here, I get another one-hit KO, so we are moving on to his final Pokémon, Linoon. Unfortunately, though, Crab Hammer does not have good accuracy, so it misses. Linoon goes for Belly Drum. Okay, so I'm just gonna knock it out on the next turn, but Crab Hammer misses again. Linoon hits a slash and gets a critical hit with it, so yeah, that's definitely a reset. Looking back at that fight, what I really should have done is after missing the first Crab Hammer, I could have selected Return, which would have knocked the Linoon out. Anyway, I didn't think of that in the moment, but at least I thought about it in my second battle. And with that, I've earned myself the Balance Badge. With it comes a 10% boost to my defense stat. And honestly, it's kind of annoying that the special boost is the last one that the game gives you, because right now Crawdont is going to get major upgrades to its special moves. First of all, I can teach Surf in the place of Crab Hammer, and then I go to Duford Town to pick up Sludge Bomb. 
I'm not going to use it now. I'll just keep it in case it's going to be useful later on. Remember, this move tends to not be that good in Hoenn because there are not many prominent grass types. After that, I grab the TM for Ice Beam, which I'm finally going to teach in the place of knockoff good riddance to this move. You were on my moveset way too long. After that, I defeat the Aqua Admins in the Weather Institute and earn myself the Mystic Water, making Surf even better. I crush Brendan, reveal some Kecleon, solve some puzzles, and now I'm ready to face Winona. Okay, so I don't have too many worries against her. I'm gonna one-hit the Swablu with Ice Beam so that it can't use Perish Song, and then she sends in Tropius, which takes four times damage from Ice Beam, so that's another one-hit. Next is Pelipper, my least favorite opponent, and believe me, this thing gets really annoying today. I get confused, it protects a lot. Finally, I snap out of confusion, hit an Ice Beam, and finish it off. Okay, so it's Skarmory next. Now for this thing, I think it makes more sense to use Surf. It is neutral, and it's also getting the boost from the Mystic Water, as well as the same type attack bonus. I take the Steel type down with a single hit, and after that, Crawdon levels up to 44, where it can finally learn Sword Stance. Now in Generation 1, if your Pokemon can learn Dig but no other ground moves, it makes sense to hold on to it way into the late game, but in Generation 3, that's not the case. This move only has base 60 power, so it's not really that good. As a result, I'm going to put Sword Stance in its place. Winona sends out her ace, Altaria. Fortunately for me, Crawdont is faster, Ice Beam does 4 times damage, and with that, I have earned myself the 6th badge. Alright, so as I do some sightseeing around Hoenn in the most gorgeous area, let's talk about how Swords Dance relates to Crawdont. It has a fantastic attack stat, but its typings don't synergize with this. Then, it gets physical moves, but most of them aren't very good. So let's go through each of them. First, it gets Dig, which is slow because it takes two turns, and it also has a low base power. Brick Break is next. It's only accessible after you beat the seventh gym and gain access to Dig. Plus, 75 power is really mediocre. Sludge Bomb has better power, but its typing is not very useful. Rock Tomb lacks everything. This move has terrible power. It's also really inaccurate. That's why I didn't teach it to Crawdont in this playthrough. Aerial Ace fills a fantastic niche, really just fighting Sydney and sometimes for a bit more PP against Phoebe. And while bypassing accuracy checks is really nice, base 60 power just isn't great. And that leaves us with Return. Obviously, this is Crawdont's best physical move. Now, complicating the decision making process for its moveset is the fact that its special attack isn't completely trash. That means both water and ice moves can be be decent, plus stab on surf with the mystic water hits really hard as I've mentioned before. So until we get to the league, I think the move set return, ice beam, surf, and sword stance is going to be the best. Okay, so that's it for sightseeing. Let's head into a cave and fight Maxi. Hypercutter prevents intimidate, and then return takes Mightyena to orange health. Next, it lowers my speed with Scary Face. Maxi uses a potion, and I knock it out. Alright, time for the Crobat. Obviously it's faster, it uses Confuse Ray. Crawdont keeps hitting itself, and as a result, Maxi defeats me. Ah, this is giving me flashbacks to the Breloom playthrough. However, I don't think it is going to be nearly as bad. I can use a Person Berry in this case to prevent confusion, and Crawdont shouldn't have problems with Crobat. Also, I can just set up on the Mightyena to boost my attack a little bit. And then, making things even better for me, the Mightyena uses Swagger, boosting my attack to plus four. Well, I hope the Crobat doesn't use Confuse Ray, but it doesn't. Going for Wing Attack instead, doing only a little, I use Return and knock it out. Last is Camerupt, Surf, four times damage, obviously I win. I take a brief breather, picking up the TM for rest, and then I head into the Team Aqua Hideout to face Matt. He's a really random trainer, and uh, it's very surprising to me because often in these playthroughs he gives me problems, which is exactly what happens today. My Crawdont is confused, and I set up with Swords Dance, so it takes so much damage when it hits itself, and I get a loss here. However, in the next battle, using the Person Berry, I just heal from Swagger's confusion, I'm able to knock the Mighty Anna out, and the following Golbat. Okay, so I'm going to head over to Shoal Cave next to pick up some important items. Here, I can grab the Never Melt Ice to boost Ice-type moves damage. This will be useful later on for Drake. It also gives me access to an extra rare candy, as well as the Shell Bell, which is a fantastic item that allows your Pokemon to gain back health every time it deals damage. After that, I take the trip to Pacific Log Town. I need this fly location for speed later on, and I want a second return TM so I have moveset flexibility. With that out of the way, I head into the Moss Deep Gym, give my Crawdont the Mystic Water, and now 
It's time for Tate and Liza. To start this fight off, I wanted to describe a mechanic to all of you. In double battles, moves that hit multiple Pokemon, like Surf, have their damage divided by two. What this means is Surf is essentially dealing the same amount of damage, but it is split between both Pokemon that receive damage. There is another category of moves, which is moves that hit all of the Pokemon on the field, so they'll also hit your ally. For example, Earthquake. In the case of these moves, they deal full damage to each Pokemon. So Earthquake will deal 100 power worth of damage to each Pokemon that is on the field, whereas Surf is only going to deal half of its power to each enemy Pokemon. And you can see that here on the first turn as I deal damage to their Pokemon. Unfortunately for me, the Clay Doll always uses Earthquake on the first turn, and it gets a crit here doing half. However, on the next turn I have enough damage to knock it out, and that's really good. Next they choose to send in Soul Rock, and this is actually the only other Pokemon on their team that can deal direct damage to Crawdont. Dark types have a really easy time against Tate and Liza. I do more than half to it, it takes in Sunlight, setting up Solar Beam, and that's perfect for me because then with my next Surf I can knock it out. Okay, so now Zatu's Confuse Ray is the only thing that can knock Crawdont out, so I figure that I should use Return, take it out, and after that I can slowly whittle the Lunatone down. So that's an easy win for me, and finally I get the boost to both of my special stats. Moss Deep City is essentially the place where you do double battles that are mandatory. So I have another one alongside Steven Stone in the Space Center. This one is really easy because I have Surf. After that, I was a little bit risky against Archie, setting up when I don't have a Person Berry, but I still managed to win. Rayquaza comes in, saves the day, and after that, I take a brief trip to the Mauville Game Corner because I want to buy a second Ice Beam TM just to give myself even more moveset flexibility for the late game. So now, it's time to take on the last gym leader, Juan. For this, the standard strategy is give your Pokemon a Person Berry, set up if you can until the Love Disk confuses you, and then go for a sweep. In this case, Crawdont has an additional advantage because its typing resists water moves as well as ice moves, which are usually Juan's best options. I managed to get all the way to plus six before the Love Disk confuses me, so now it is time to sweep. If we check the speed stats out on the right hand side of the screen, you can see that I'm going to move first against all of his Pokemon, except his ace Kingdra. So in a series of four one hits, I make it all the way there. Kingdra uses Ice Beam, Luckily, it doesn't get a freeze, and with that, I've defeated Juan. By the way, I'm realizing that my Juan is uh, turning more into Juan again, so I'll continue to work on that. There's one more trainer before the league. It is Wally. Gardevoir is surprisingly able to take hits. When I think about powerful psychic types, I'm generally reminded of Alakazam's fragility to physical moves, but this thing is cut from different cloth. I think that I should give it a try sometime soon. With Wally out of the way, I backtrack to the move deleter, and I want to remove Surf here. This is specifically so that I can teach Aerial Ace before Sydney, because bypassing accuracy checks during that fight is going to be incredibly important. So now, I'm prepared. Let's see how the Elite Four is going to go. Sydney leads with Mightyena. Hypercutter prevents Intimidate, so I'm going into this battle in incredibly good shape. Also, the Mightyena doesn't really have anything that is going to threaten Crawdont because it doesn't know Swagger. So what I can do is just set up for free with Swords Dance, and then use Aerial Ace to get what is essentially going to be a free win. Like honestly, from here, I just sweep. There is nothing to talk about. It is so easy. Let's move on to the battle against Phoebe. First turn, her Dusclops is going to use Protect, so I can obviously use Sword Stance to boost my attack stat. However, now I'm going to be relying on Aerial Ace to knock the Dusclops out, and unfortunately I can't. This thing is really defensive. Pressure is lowering my PP, and I'm scared that I won't be able to finish, so I need one more turn of setup to ensure KOs. She sent in her second Bayonet first because it knows Thunderbolt. In this case, it takes me under half, but I heal a little bit with a Citrus Berry. However, now that I have plus four, I'm able to one-hit it and the following Sableye. All right, now it is time for her Ace Dusclops. This thing is so tanky, and it actually survives. It uses Earthquake, but luckily it's not very good offensively, so it doesn't do much. And with that, I have defeated her. Aerial Ace's PP was able to go the distance. 
Glacia is next, and obviously this fight is not going to be difficult. I can set up with Sword Stance against the first Celio, and then sweep with Brick Break, which I just talked to Crawdont. While I do that, I want to now compare with Breloom's results. Crawdont is slower at this point in the game, by about 7 minutes. However, our top time in Emerald so far is Milotic, with a time of 1 hour, 58 minutes, and 56 seconds. So there is still a chance to beat that time if everything else goes smoothly. Remember, Breloom was on track to beat that time too, but then it lost all of its time to Drake as well as Steven. However, unlike Breloom, Crawdont has an answer for Drake in the form of Ice Beam. Before that though, his Shellgon is going to use Protect, and I'm going to use Swords Dance once, and now it is time to start my sweep. The first three of his Pokémon are going to be free, because I have outspeeds on all of them. Flygon is the first Pokémon that is going to hit Crawdont. It does one third with Earthquake, and I knock it out. Okay, it's time for Drake's ace, Salamence, which is going to move first. It chooses Dragon Claw, and it does so much damage. But Crawdont just barely survives, allowing it to use Ice Beam, which does four times damage, and the Salamence goes down. All right, before we jump into the Wallace fight, let's talk about some things that go through my mind in the playthrough at this point. What I am thinking about is how do I plan for Wallace and Steven at the same time? Giving up a move that I can't get access to again is always a bad choice at this point, so sometimes I take dead weight into the fight with Wallace just so that I'll have a chance against Steven. When I did my playthrough with the shiny Poochiena, which ended up as a Mightyena, I unlearned Shadow Ball, and a lot of people said that this would have been useful against Steven, and I really think that that was the case. However, I do want to remind everyone that from Generation 2 to Generation 5, the Steel type does resist the Ghost type, so it wouldn't have been that useful against Steven. However, in this case, for Crawdont I've prepared, I know that I already have another Ice Beam TM, and this move is not useful against Wallace, so I'm going to teach Sludge Bomb in its place. Finally, this move is actually going to see a little bit of play. So now I have to make a decision. Do I use any rare candies? Remember, Crawdont is the fluctuating growth rate, so it is going to level up slower and slower as we go. If I can, I want to save these as long as is possible, so let's go into Wallace at this level. If Crawdont can do it, honestly, I'd be very surprised. First, Wallace sends in Waylord. I'm going to go for Swords Dance right away to set up, because Water Spout is not going to hit for very much damage. As a result, the Waylord chooses Double Edge, I can set up one more Swords Dance, it goes for Rain Dance, and now I think it is time to sweep. Return gets the KO, then Wallace sends in Ludicolo. Unfortunately, this thing outspeeds me, it gets to set up Double Team, but luckily Sludge Bomb hits and gets the knockout. Okay, Tentacruel is next, and ah, uh, this thing again moves first. It seems like speed is my issue in this battle. Luckily for me, it misses with the Hydro Pump, so I take no damage and Return gets the knockout once again. Alright, it's time for his ace, Milotic. This thing knows that its moves aren't very effective, so it's going to use Toxic to try and knock Crawdont out, but it just misses. Either way, it wouldn't have mattered because I have a Pecha Berry. Return gets the KO, Whiskash. Finally, I move first against this thing and I knock it out, and after that, I've made it to his last Pokemon. On Gyarados. Hypercutter just says no to Intimidate, I barely outspeed, and Crawdont defeats Wallace on its first attempt. That is an incredible time! 1 hour, 40 minutes, and 9 seconds, with 5 resets at level 58. This is a game time of 6 hours and 19 minutes. So Crawdont is on track to clock in with one of the fastest times yet. However, Steven Stone is usually known for messing things up, so I have to prepare for him. In this case, Sludge Bomb is completely useless, so I'm going to put Rest in its place. Up to this point, I have saved 12 rare candies, so I'm going to use all of them now to take Crawdont up from level 58 to level 70. I'm going to give it a Pecha Berry, because the first Skarmory loves to use Toxic, and then I'm going to put Surf back in the place of Return, because this move can be useful against the Claydol, which Brick Break is not going to do very much to. With these things in place, Place, I think that I'm prepared to take on Steven Stone. First, Steven sends in Skarmory, which is an absolutely fantastic lead for him. I'm gonna have to set up Swords Dance against this thing and then sweep. Luckily for me, it goes for Spikes on the first turn, Aerial Ace on the second turn, which actually does a decent amount of damage, and then it uses Toxic, which my Pecha Berry heals. Alright, so I got to plus 6, I'm ready to sweep. I go for Brick Break, but because it's a Flying-type, Skarmory doesn't go down. It uses Toxic again. 
Uh, okay, so I'm going to have to heal that with rest eventually before moving on. And when I try to, I get stuck constantly needing to heal against the Skarmory. This is the downside of not having a move like Bulk Up that boosts your defense. Then, in that case, I would be able to rest just once, and then knock the Skarmory out and move on with the battle. But in this case, I'm stuck healing over and over again, until I get the luck that I need. Skarmory can miss Steel Wing, for example, and then I can finally knock it out. Okay, so I have green health going into the rest of the fight. Steven chooses Aggron next, Brick Break does 4 times damage, and gets the KO. Cradily comes out, it also goes down to a single Brick Break, and now it is time for the Clay Doll. Okay, so I have Surf to manage this thing, but unfortunately is not doing that much damage. Plus, making matters worse is the fact that Claydol can use Light Screen to boost its special defenses. I try to outlast this thing using Rest, but in the end I run out of PP, it's doing too much, and Crawdont goes down. Reflecting on the results from that battle, Surf just isn't that useful elsewhere in the fight. So I think that bringing Return in to KO the Claydol right away is the best choice. It works, and I move on to the Metagross. Okay, so here Brick Break is the better choice, even though it's only doing neutral damage. And in this case, it takes the Metagross just to orange. It strikes back with Earthquake, and Crawdont once again goes down. So if I had more health, I could survive Metagross's Earthquake, and I can use the Shell Bell to get it, because when I KO the Agron and the Cradily in a single hit, I will gain back health. Claydol is going to hit me because it outspeeds by 1. However, I'll just gain back health when I knock it out with Return. So now I have green health for the Metagross. I go for Brick Break, taking it to Orange. I heal a little bit with the Shell Bell, then it uses Earthquake, which I do survive, and with that, I get the KO. So, all that's left over is our Maldo, the Pokemon that is, uh, it's like a, it's a Dark Steel type. I'm sticking with Dark Steel type from yesterday, and yeah, I can just one hit it with Earthquake. So, Crawdot clocks in with a time of 1 hour 51 minutes and 9 seconds, with 7 resets at level 70. This took 6 hours and 42 minutes of game time. Out of all of my results in Pokemon Emerald, this is the fastest time yet. Crawdont has taken the first spot from Milotic. By the way, with the same number of resets, and it also finished the game at a lower level. And that leads me to a conclusion about the growth rates that I've been testing. I did two playthroughs with erratic growth rate Pokemon, both Milotic and Altaria, and then I did two playthroughs with fluctuating growth rate Pokemon, Breloom and Crawdont. And now I think that I can say that the fluctuating growth rate is going to be the better performer in solo challenges. The erratic growth rate just starts the game off way too slow, and by the time it's starting to level up fast, you already have a bunch of rare candy. Candies. Plus, you don't gain access to the rare candies when the erratic growth rate is at its slowest. Some people suggested that I should be using my rare candies right away, but by the time you get the first one, you're like level 28 and it isn't leveling up that slowly anyways. You'd want to have your rare candies between levels like 5 and 15. Thinking about all this makes me so scared to do an erratic growth rate first stage Pokemon. That run is going to be a nightmare in the early game. Anyways, in both cases, the fluctuating growth rate Pokemon performed really well in the early game. I think Breloom would perform much better with preparation and a second run, whereas Crawdont performed incredibly on its first attempt. Continuing the comparison between these two fluctuating growth rate Pokemon, I think typing is really key here. They both don't really have that good types, but their move pools make up for it. However, with Crawdont, it was just a little bit more finely tuned to deal with trainers like Drake as well as Steven. Plus, let's be real, Swords Dance is one of the best moves out there. However, things get really surprising when we rank based on game time because Crawdont is now the fastest Pokemon in this ranking as well. It beat Rayquaza, and not by a little bit, by a lot. In this case though, I think that Rayquaza eventually is going to perform better than Crawdont. What's happening here is just that my skill has increased dramatically since I played Rayquaza back in September of 2022. Okay, so that's it for the fluctuating growth rate Pokemon. From here, I have some fun Emerald runs planned. I'm going to do Hariyama, which I have never used before. And I'm also going to play Exploud, which is one of my favorite Pokemon. I'm a musician, and this intimidating sound-based Pokemon was just always so cool to me. Anyways, that's it for this video. Like, subscribe, and ring the Chimeco. So you're notified when I post new content. If you support me on Patreon or through YouTube memberships, thank you so much. It means the world to me. Now, if you've made it this far in the video, you're incredible. I'll see you in the next one.